Every year, the deserts of Earth expand a little more, swallowing up huge tracts of previously fertile land. We are working hard to slow or stop that, but how do we go about reversing it? So today we will be looking at reclaiming the deserts. In many ways, when it comes to making desert fertile, it's more about repair and reverting to a prior state than introducing something new. A concern in this series is the impact of some of these techniques on existing ecosystems, but our current deserts aren't entirely natural. We have a lot of options, from the low-tech to the high-tech, subtle to brute force. Some are slow, some fast. Some can be implemented locally and others require vast regional or even global efforts. Which ones we might use will vary on circumstances. Some tactics rely on altering the weather, others on diverting fresh water from existing supplies, or creating new fresh water by desalination. Some focus on conserving water or getting the most out of what supplies you have, while others might involve gene tailoring species to survive on salt water, skipping desalination entirely. But just like terraforming a planet, there is more to reclaiming a desert than just adding water. You need soil rich in the right nutrients and full of organic materials and organisms. You can't simply brew vats of microorganisms and mix them in with the sand, you need roots to keep everything from washing out or being blown away. One could also use a mixture of retaining walls and artificial fibrous materials to help further stabilize everything. Clay and biochar can be mixed into sand, poured up from deep or down to build up a soil base. We've also got a new material called LNC, liquid nanoclay, that has shown great facility in binding sandy and arid soil up quite quickly, and can be mass produced. We'd also most likely introduce nitrogen fixing bacteria, probably engineered lines that have been tailored to pull nitrogen from the atmosphere faster and more efficiently in order to enrich the newly created soil and build a layer of silt to bind the sand. We don't necessarily have to go high tech though. By planting bands of plants along desert margins or an existing oasis, you can slowly invade the desert regions so long as you can supply them with water. Getting that water and keeping it there is our main focus for today, but we don't want to underestimate the soil aspect. As our ancestors found out, back when they first began experimenting with bringing water to parched lands for farming, keeping that soil in good condition once you brought water in by canals and irrigation was just as hard as getting the water there. It's also a way we can experiment with terraforming other worlds, which will need far more work than deserts. Indeed as we often point out when folks suggest we should abandon dreams of space colonization to focus on Earth's problems, not only can we walk and chew bubblegum at the same time, but we can often learn things working on one problem that will help on another. As an example of that, we often worry about greenhouse gases, rising water levels, decreasing biodiversity, and supplying enough food for a growing planetary population. Soil is a good carbon sink, and soil that's deeper and has a higher carbon density is more productive, more flood resistant, more drought tolerant and supports a more robust ecosystem. It's not a small amount of carbon either. If you add up every kilogram of carbon located inside plants, animals, and the atmosphere, that total is about half what's stored in our soil. Now soil doesn't just store carbon, it stores water too. Not much, relatively speaking, but every bit counts if you're worried about rising sea levels. And if you start making lakes and reservoirs too, it starts to add up. This of course gets us back to water and how we get it. We should note a few things. First, Earth's fresh water supply is produced by solar evaporation, and that's actually not a very efficient way to desalinate water. We get something like 500 quadrillion liters of rainfall on Earth every year, which sounds like a lot, but we get something like 5 trillion trillion joules of energy from the sun every year driving that. So in terms of efficiency, sunlight produces about 1 liter of fresh water for every 10 million joules of energy, about 3 kilowatt hours. Most desalination processes use around that much energy to produce a thousand times that much drinking water. Sunlight is free of course, but as channel regulars know, in a lot of futuristic scenarios we discuss here, your economic bottleneck becomes waste heat removal, 
and it will be important here too, more on that in a bit. Second, most of that rain basically goes to waste. The majority falls right back down on the oceans, much of the remainder falls in places and amounts where it drains off unused by plants and goes right back into the oceans, often carrying critical nutrients along with it. Even once it is in the ground and plants, it's often not used too efficiently, evaporating away again. Slapping a greenhouse over a location obviously drops its water usage a lot, but so does just having a ground cover that minimizes evaporation from the soil. So too, watering areas at the right time of the day can help retain that moisture, while doing it at the wrong time of day can not only see a lot of it evaporate away, but scorch the plants while doing it. Beads of water act like lenses, concentrating sunlight just like a magnifying glass. Not usually an issue when it's actually raining since the sky is cloudy, but problematic while irrigating. Third, there's already enough water, even on land, to green every desert on Earth. It's just not located at the right places and times. Seasonal river flooding occurs even in areas that are regularly drought blighted, so if you can store it and move it, all the better. Deep reservoirs are better than wide ones because it means less surface area for evaporation and exposure to sunlight. We spent the last two episodes talking about colonizing the oceans and building islands, and it's worth remembering that if you have a big lake acting as a reservoir, that's useful for other purposes, as we saw in those episodes. You can do farming in lakes, both classic marine life and floating raft farms, which isn't high tech or revolutionary, after all, we've been doing that in Mesoamerica for centuries. Also, while moving water horizontally is relatively cheap compared to desalinating it, moving it vertically is more expensive. It takes about a million joules of energy to lift a cubic meter of water every hundred meters of height, and most of the Sahara, for instance, is far higher than that. Not every arid region is high altitude of course, but water does drain down so there is a correlation. While the energy needs for pumping would be less than evaporative desalination, that can easily exceed our more efficient desalination processes. If you'd like a detailed walkthrough of desalination and pumping math for the Sahara, Real Engineering's channel has a great episode on terraforming the Sahara, I'll link below. That digs into the numbers on desalination and using forests as carbon sinks in the Sahara, with current figures and technology. I should mention you can also move water around continents, shifting it from wetter to drier areas, but don't assume we can't move it between continents either. Tunnels and pipes don't stop working just because you hit a coastline, and you could reap a net energy savings where the fresh water source was a higher altitude than the destination. When it comes down to it, if you need to cool some places down and warm others up, water is a pretty good medium. We'll discuss that more in our topic for next time in the series, Colonizing Our Arctic Regions. While such a thing would require millions of kilometers of piping, we already have millions of kilometers of piping. Needless to say, approaches like that require a lot of construction and a lot of maintenance too. And while pumping water around and up to fall down on crops isn't too energy intensive, it still does take energy, and let's not forget the cost of maintaining all that infrastructure too. One technology we often discuss using on the channel is orbital mirrors or shades. You can use them to cool a planet by blocking some light, and you can use them to add light too. You can concentrate that a bit as well, and mirrors are cheap and easy to make, and shades even easier. Thus they'd be one of the easier industries to get going on a place like the moon, saving us launch costs. They also need no structural support in orbit. There's no wind or gravity for that structure to resist, so they can be thin foils. Now a caveat to that is that while focusing light down on some bit of sea, or on an artificial shallow salt water lake, will get you a lot more evaporation, it's also adding heat, and doubly so because water vapor is a greenhouse gas. That's okay though because you're getting enough extra bang for your buck in terms of evaporation that you can add shades to block light to compensate. Now, we happen to be pretty amateur still at weather modeling, especially when we're tinkering with the system and can't use historical data as a reliable guidepost, but we will get better at it and a good mix of shades and mirrors could allow us to just tweak the existing weather patterns so rain was coming down where we want it in the amounts we want it. Less flooding, less droughts. 
As I said back in our Power Satellites episode, I was never a big fan of beaming energy down to Earth, but that approach has really grown on me as an alternative in case we never get commercial fusion going. It also would serve as a multi-trillion dollar sector of our economy, one we can kickstart a serious orbital infrastructure off of. Solar mirrors and shades, which use almost the exact same raw materials and manufacturing, complement this very well. If we couple these with improved computing and modeling, we could arm ourselves with powerful tools to address environmental concerns. However, you wouldn't necessarily have to go way up in space to accomplish this trick, a tower works just fine, and hardly needs to be large or tall. We've discussed using mushroom habitats in colonizing Mercury, basically meals above a habitat to bounce light away, and the reverse for farming in the asteroid belt in colonizing Ceres to concentrate light instead. Both could be adapted to accomplish what solo meals and shades do, as would big balloons or blimps covered with meals on top, akin to those we discussed in colonizing Venus. Orbital options are better, removes all the atmosphere issues, but harder to build too, just another reminder that the tricks we learn for off Earth will often be adaptable to Earth and vice versa. If you're pumping some seawater into pools, under glass and a lens, letting that evaporate condense on the dome and drain down the sides, and flushing the remaining seawater back out to the seas, you get the same effect as our orbital meals. For that matter, you hardly need a lens. A nice tunnel greenhouse with a canal of seawater down the middle and plants on the side will get all its fresh water that way. Making all that glass, or whatever transparent material you use, wouldn't be cheap, but at least there is a ready supply of sand on hand to use for construction. Of course any power plant that uses steam as a working fluid can also recover that water, For that matter, any manufacturing process, like melting glass, produces a lot of waste heat that can be used for evaporation too. It would be a bit challenging to make a solar kiln that could make glass sheeting, but it's doable and certainly solar panels or other power sources could be used for that. If you're using plastic, then some of those plants can be used as feedstock for the plastics too. Very energy intensive, not to mention labor intensive, But it's worth remembering that we have a lot of deserts, and even just the Sahara alone, if converted into farmland with the same production per acre of modern farms, could grow about 12 billion tons of grain per year, about six times our current global output. As we've mentioned before, greenhouses are vastly more productive than open air farming, in terms of output per land area anyway and that would be true of ones used principally for desalinating water too. Moreover, you need not cover every bit of land in them, since greenhouses don't use much water themselves, you can transfer excess water produced in them to irrigate the surrounding area. It's also a good way to move heat from a desalination greenhouse, they get awful hot on their own. You could shade one or ventilate, but it's far more efficient to use the water and irrigation pipes as your radiator and thermal storage mass instead. If done properly, the temperature differential can also power your pumping system. We're not limited to sunlight though, if technology keeps improving in the areas that look favorable right now, tiny nanomaterial meshes can simply screen salt out of water, and we may be able to scale that process up. And of course, fusion seems to be on the horizon, and with vast amounts of energy, you can run all the desalination you want. Again, even modern techniques are about 1,000 times more efficient than ambient sunlight on water, so if you've got a huge cheap power source, you can just make what fresh water you need and pump and spray it around your fields and forests exactly in the amount and times calculated for highest efficiency. Works on normal crops too, we irrigate a lot right now, and while desalination is way more energy intensive than pumping water, the cost of transporting water is still enough that even in places like where I live, right on the Great Lakes, we can still have drought issues. Energy doesn't need to get much cheaper to end that. Cheap energy also helps a lot on producing fertilizers, especially nitrogen compounds. But just as we'd like to use more nitrogen fixing crops than manufactured nitrogen fertilizers, biology offers us some options for desalination too. First off, salt water may be harmful to most terrestrial life, but oceanic animals and plants do just fine on it, 
It's not like seaweed and fish lack mechanisms for dealing with salt water. Quite to the contrary, it's what everything evolved in originally and the stuff that migrated to land just lost the ability. You could grow crops in a desert just fine on seawater, they just need to be modified or tolerant plants. We have quite a few plants like mangroves, used to more briny and brackish conditions, neo river deltas, that would contain genes we could splice into something like corn, and there are already some salt tolerant rice crops. Actually, we have a lot of crops that are relatively tolerant to soil salinity. In the ancient Fertile Crescent, they also had to deal with salts burning up from irrigation, and found that some crops would still grow in soil whose salinity was too high for others, and doubtless the ancestors of many of our crops got bred from the ones that did better in salinated soil. People often worry about GMO food crops, but it is always good to remember that most of the natural crops we have these days are about as natural as the poodle is. We can modify crops to live in more saline soil and thrive, and we've gotten fairly good at leaching and flushing salts out of soil too. Of course you're not necessarily using soil. We always talk about using hydroponics or aquaponics in space or in vertical farming, and we could just as easily use seawater as freshwater. You could cut canals and quanats into a desert region, full of seawater, and cover them with glass to capture that evaporated water, use what you need to grow crops, then mix the remaining water along with the plant matter into the sand to compost into soil. Oceanic plants might live in salt water, but they use metabolic processes to keep intercellular salinity low. You could probably even alter a plant to overproduce water and act as a transport, like some vine network that runs from a seawater pool or canal to a ways away where it transpires out large quantities of fresh water vapor for recapture and irrigation. We were talking in previous episodes about how people like to live near coasts or river shores, and about how we might build lots of snaky islands out into the seas to maximize this real estate. I also mentioned cutting canals into continents to achieve a similar result, and you could do the same in deserts, just tons of canals of seawater, evaporating fresh water that's collected, and move to the soil nearby. And if we don't mind building very long and deep pipes, ones kilometers deep, we can also take advantage of the very large pressure differential between the top and bottom of the sea to act as the pump for a reverse osmosis filter. This requires a very long and sturdy pipe, but we already discussed making some of those last time in colonizing the oceans. This gives you a very cheap way of desalinating water and dispersing the waste brine. We also mentioned the option of going a bit deeper and drilling boreholes right into the mantle to extract heat and minerals, moho mining, and how that's easier in the oceans where the mantle is closer. You could also use that steam from cooling that magma straw or just let the boreholes act as cloud factories. Again, fusion is your best option as are desalination techniques that don't use evaporation for water per unit of energy. But any time you can get something as a free byproduct of something else anyway, that's even better. And if you're willing to build big enough, tall and deep, you can get some truly mountain-like towers that can get those freebies. So lots of techniques. Which ones we use in the future will depend on tons of factors and not just those involving technological progress. If you want to pump water from the Congo or Mississippi to the Sahara or Mojave, You don't just have to worry about how the energy and infrastructure maintenance costs stack up against desalination plants near those places, but whether or not the source regions are okay with that. Rivers tend to be borders too, so getting permission is almost always going to involve getting it from multiple entities. Small scale projects that don't need to bring in much exterior resources will work better in some areas while others can more easily engage in massive efforts both in terms of cost and geography. Water rights are traditionally a very big deal, wars have often been fought over them, and countless smaller scale disputes have occurred and still are commonly resolved in courts even today. But there is also a lot of fresh water not in dispute, such as river water and glacial meltwater that just flows into the oceans. Most of this water can be redirected or pumped to useful locations, or at least retained and used locally for irrigation or brackish farming. If you're a smaller farmer near the coast, you can build a seawater greenhouse without much exterior help or permission, 
If you're inland, you can build an air well condenser or a dew condenser to get some water out of the air or concentrate what comes down in the dew. Keep in mind, a place that only gets a few centimeters of rain or dew a year, as opposed to more like the meter we'd like on good farmland, still is getting enough water to grow a small portion of land. Get a plot of land and stick a house on half of it, and all that water sloshing off the roof just doubled your effective rainfall level. So if I roof over a section of land with a greenhouse, or even just a sheet of plastic, the rain that would fall there will slide over onto the other soil, concentrating that rain. In a lot of marginal areas on the edge of the deserts, where we're fighting desertification, you only need a little more water, so even just partial greenhousing combined with some water conservation tricks like mulching would be enough to halt that expanding desert and start pushing it back. It's interesting in a way, because as our farming and water conservation techniques improve, these desolate areas become very attractive as our breadbaskets. Now, they do have their own ecologies already, but as mentioned our deserts have been expanding, largely from our own activities, so pushing those back a ways seems preferable to knocking over existing forests for farmland, and a lot of the techniques needed to make them work all the ones we are likely to be implementing in future generations to get better yields from existing croplands anyway. If you want to maximize yields, you farm under a greenhouse, it doesn't much matter where that's at, and you'd inevitably be supplementing the desert ecologies nearby too, allowing them higher densities of flora and fauna to replace land lost to those ecosystems, much of which was only recently obtained anyway. We'll see a similar factor in play when we discuss trying to make Arctic regions livable in the next episode in the series, and that will be a good deal harder too, since beyond being cold and poorly lit, they don't get much rain either, albeit they have plenty of fresh water tied up in the ice. Speaking of that, there's also the classic option of towing icebergs to the desert or pumping meltwater to them. Lots of options, and lots of research going into this area too, we only scratched the surface today. Ultimately, the best approach is likely to involve subtly altering the weather and in a way where we can predict and select the outcomes, using the minimum force for the maximum result, rather than brute force techniques or trial and error. Anyone who's seen a weather forecast knows our predictive capability on weather is still limited, but improving. When it comes to predicting weather on other planets or inside giant artificial habitats, we've a lot of work to do, but the basic forces and variables are known to us, yet it can seem a bit mysterious because discussions of weather tend not to give the details. It can be a lot of fun trying to figure out what the weather would be like if we created a hot zone in the Atlantic, off the African coast, or inside some O'Neill cylinder on a flat planet, and if you're interested in learning how to do such things yourself, or just want to better understand how the weather or seasons work, then try out Brilliant's course Out in Nature. It's a good place to get started in learning along with Brilliant, and it covers everything from the reasons for the seasons, to the greenhouse effect and Coriolis effect, from pressure systems and hurricanes to tides. If you want to increase your own understanding of that topic or others, and have fun while you're doing it, Go to Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and sign up for free, and also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Next week we'll return to the moon to look at how things may play out as colonization proceeds and we begin getting some serious civilizations up there in Battle for the Moon, and we'll take a look at our book of the month, Artemis, the newest novel by Andy Weir, author of The Martian. The week after that we'll go further out in space and time to look at options like suspended animation, freezing, and stasis for moving colonists to distant worlds, and the various ways you might operate such vessels in sleep or ships. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.